Ordinary mouse traps have a few problems. They work only once. So in 1861, a Sussex carpenter called Colin Pullinger came up with this, a perpetual mouse trap. He claimed that with one of these traps, he'd caught 28 mice in a single night. It was a runaway success. He sold two million of these traps at half a crown each and made himself a fortune. He was one of a new breed of Victorians who were making it big. Victorian era, you could make a lot of money if you had some luck and a really good idea. One chap who did just that up here in Northumberland was William Armstrong, who spotted the power in moving water and made himself a fortune. William Armstrong began his career as a lawyer, but his real passion was engineering. He invented hydraulic machines that transformed industry, and he became one of the richest men in Britain. And this, Newcastle, is where he made his money. The thing was, in 1837, when Victoria came to the throne, Britain was world leader in production of iron and steam engines. And we just recovered from the economic disaster of the Napoleonic Wars. So there was tremendous boom in imports and exports. And the docks here in Newcastle were fantastically busy. Armstrong invented the hydraulic crane the perfect tool for getting all the goods onto the ships and off again. The principle of hydraulics is really quite simple. Just look at these two syringes. One is much bigger than the other. If I push this big plunger down a little bit, watch how much the little one moves. You see, it's moving up about five times as fast. So you can get five times the movement. But the really clever bit is to run it in reverse. If I put a little weight on here, it'll lift a much bigger weight the other side. A one kilogram shoved on there would lift five kilograms on the other side. So you can use hydraulics to multiply force. Armstrong's business grew to become the biggest on the Tyne. In 1868, he even had an entire bridge demolished, replacing it with a hydraulic swing bridge to enable ever bigger ships to get to his works. After almost 130 years and a quarter of a million swings, it's still in perfect working order, and its keeper, George Fenwick, promised I could have a go at working it. So what's the first thing we have to do? The first thing you're going to do is blow the horn. Blow the horn. What, once? Three. Three times. Three horns. Quick. Right, I've done that. Five turns on the water. Five turns. Which way? Anti-clockwise. Come on, big strong lad like you. One, two, three, four, five. Right, like that. Like that, that's right. smashing. Now if you take this one. This lever. Okay. So kick across. that. Wait, wait. Now take your arms out. Pull that one back now. That one back. And now with that one. Now you're ready to rock. So I'm turn the bridge? Yes, turn the bridge. Quarter, turn. quarter turn on the lever. Quarters. And it's clockwise. Right. Right. One, two, three, go. Oh, it's easy. Oh, no, it's That's not so easy. You'll snap that. By turning the controls, I'm releasing the water power to drive the hydraulic rams. The rams turn the gears, and the gears turn the bridge. Hey, hey, we're moving. That's fantastic. This. It's William Armstrong's bridge, 1,200 tonnes of it, and I'm turning it. Look at that. Wow, I'm driving a bridge. <laughs> William Armstrong used all the money he made from hydraulics to jump onto another bandwagon. He made guns and warships, and he wound up employing 20,000 men. He was the biggest industrialist in the country, and that brought its own rewards. At Rothbury, in the heart of the Northumbrian countryside, 
William Armstrong built Cragside, one of the most luxurious houses in Britain and the first in the world to be powered by hydroelectricity. He got his power by bringing water down these cast iron pipes from Nelly Moss Lakes, 100 metres up the hill. And of course, it arrives here with tremendous pressure. And he used all that pressure of water to drive this turbine. In here, there are buckets being forced round by all that water. And once he's got that rotary motion, he's able to generate electricity using this generator. And he made 10 kilowatts of power. Armstrong used his electricity to make his house a showcase of the latest Victorian technology. Even members of the royal family couldn't resist an invitation. Cragside became known as the Palace of the Modern Magician. In the bedrooms, there were electric bells to summon either the maid or the valet. And when it was time for dinner, they saved muscle power and lung power by using an electric dinner gong. Electric fire alarm. He even had a telephone. Hello? Hello? Basically, it was to call for more power from the powerhouse, but, of course, he was one of the first people in the country to have a telephone, so he couldn't phone anybody else. But the most amazing thing about Cragside was this, the electric light. Cragside was the first house in the world to be equipped with the light bulb, developed by Armstrong's close friend, Joseph Wilson Swan. From water power to electric light, Victorian inventors were making it big. But the living conditions of the new industrialists stood in stark contrast to those of the thousands of workers they employed. In overcrowded cities, most people had to live in cramped and squalid conditions. After a terrible epidemic of cholera swept through Bradford in 1848, a rich mill owner called Titus Salt decided his workers deserved a better deal. So he embarked on a, an ambitious project to build them a utopia out in the countryside, away from all the pollution and disease. Salt chose a beautiful spot in the heart of the Air Valley, and he called it Salt Air. Salt owns seven woolen mills in Bradford. So, to get all his workers under one roof at Salt Air, he needed to build a mill of unprecedented size. Up here on the top floor is what used to be the biggest room in the entire world. It's an incredible space, almost 200 yards long. There were hundreds and hundreds of workers in here. A massive production line. Every day, the factory produced 18 miles of cloth. But the mill was only the beginning. Over the next 23 years, Titus Salt built a whole town. Along streets named after his family and even his wife's friends, he built 800 houses for his workers. He built shops, schools, a community centre and a hospital. He even provided allotments so that the residents of Salt Air could grow their own fruit and veg. In fact, there was almost everything you needed, except a pub. When Titus Salt died in 1876, a hundred thousand people came to mourn his passing, and he was buried in the church that he had built. For the mid-Victorians, business was booming. But it wasn't all good news. More business meant more traffic. And London, the world's financial capital, was grinding to a halt. But that in itself was a business opportunity. If anyone could solve London's traffic problems, they'd make a fortune. The only trouble was there wasn't any space to build new roads. So perhaps the answer was to build a new railway underground. In the 1880s, private investors took a huge gamble on a radical electric transport system 100 feet below London's streets. Um, Mike, 
It's very dark in here. Where are we? You're standing at the bottom of one of the shafts that was excavated to help in the construction of London's tube railways. The idea was basically to sink a series of shafts, which were basically where the stations were going to be for most of the railways, and then they could actually dig the running tunnels between the stations. Whose idea was it in the first place? Really, you can look to a man called James Henry Greathead, and he'd seen things like the construction of Lambeth Bridge, where people were using cast iron pipes to help form the foundations. And along with a colleague called Barlow, they came up with the idea, well, if you could turn this technology, this pipe technology, truly on its side, it would enable you to quickly, cheaply and efficiently dig tunnels under cities like London. This is one of the cast iron lined tunnels that was built using the Great Head Shield. How did that work? It's a cast iron or metal ring which provides a safe working environment for the tunnellers. And it's actually almost like a pastry cutter, a 12 foot pastry cutter on its side with the sharp pointy edges into the clay. And it uses a sequence of rams which actually sit against these cast iron lining rings. They push it forward into the clay. Yeah. The clay's dug out, taken away from the tunnels. And when they've dug enough out, they retract the rams and then fit another of the cast iron oh, lining rings in place. Oh, dead easy. So that's what, 18 inches at a time? That's it. Basically, these are prefabricated pieces of cast iron. Right. And of course, the Victorians were very fond of cast iron. It was yes. a modern technological advance for them. And they developed systems actually of having separate styles of lining for the top of the tunnel. And if you look up there, you'll see it's marked T. T. Oh, wonderful. For top. <laughs> and then further down on the side, you'll notice here that you've got O for ordinary. Right. And this was to help them put so you the couldn't get it back wrong. together. You basically couldn't You're get it wrong. Tab A into slot B. Right? Precisely. <laughs> it's, it's a giant Meccano kit in many respects. You mean I could do it? Almost. You could build one of these world. tunnels. <laughs> Fairly heavy, but it saved, of course, having to use really skilled bricklayers to build yes. vast lengths of these complicated tunnels. And, and it must have been quick, too. It was remarkably quick. Once they got the technique sorted out, the bulk of London's central area tube network was dug in a little over two and a half, just under three years. Wow, that is amazing, isn't it? The astute investors in what the Victorians christened the tube made a wise gamble. In the first two weeks alone, they collected 165,000 tuppenny fares. Not all inventors thought big. It was often a better bet to come up with something small that people really wanted. And as Victorian literacy continued to increase, more and more people needed to write. For most people, that meant a quill pen like this. Now, quill pens are quite fun to use. You cut the thing diagonally, and then you write with it like this. But the trouble is, they're very soft. And so it wears down, and sooner or later, you need a new one. The only option was a handmade metal nib, probably a gold one like this. And these were far too expensive for most people. Joseph Gillett came up with the answer. He produced steel nibs. Gillett made loads of money, but he could hardly have foreseen that the material he'd used for his pen nibs, steel, was about to transform the world. With buildings made of brick and stone, you could only build to a certain height because the building got too heavy. But once you had a steel skeleton and walls simply hung from it, you could build quickly and as high as you liked. The first steel frame building in the world was built in Chicago in 1885. And in 1896, they built one in England at West Hartlepool. It was a completely new way of thinking about building, and it opened the door, literally, to some rather confusing inventions. The revolving door was invented by Theophilus van Cannel in 1888, and the idea was first to get all these people in and out of the building very smoothly. But actually, there was a more fundamental reason. Because of all the hot air rising in the building, there were terrific drafts through ordinary doors, and you couldn't get them open or shut. And then there was the escalator, which started life as a fairground ride, invented by Jesse Reno in 1891. 
and turned into a practical system by a chap called Charles D. Seeberger in 1899. But a big problem with these high buildings was that people weren't prepared to walk up more than about four flights of stairs. So the most important innovation of all was the safety elevator, invented in 1852 by Elisha Graves Otis. Most people thought that the idea of travelling in a lift was too dangerous even to contemplate. Otis was convinced he had a mechanism that would prevent the lift from plummeting to the ground even if the cable snapped. But nobody would believe him, so he had to become a showman and he built a gigantic wooden model at the New York Exposition of 1853. Let me show you how it worked. When I pull down the rope, which is going to lift the lift, you see the rope's tightening up, and now this becomes horizontal, this spring compresses, and this spigot here disappears inside the lift car. But suppose the rope breaks like that, then what happens is that that spring pushes the lever down, pushes the spigot out, and so it's going to engage with these teeth, and that means that the lift cannot fall. That was the secret of Otis's mechanism. When Otis unveiled his huge construction in New York, he drew... What they were about to see was a death-defying demonstration, which I'm going to try and repeat. A huge crowd gathered on the floor below while they winched Otis up to a dizzying height. When they got there, the platform swayed and the crowd gasped in anticipation. And then Otis called for his assistant to cut the rope. Go on, cut the rope! Hey, it worked! It locked up, I haven't plunged to my death. All the crowd were amazed, everyone was convinced. Sadly, Otis died at the age of 50 and never lived to see his wonderful invention transform the skylines of the world but his elevators certainly made it big. But skyscrapers weren't the only invention to come from abroad. In the summer of 1868, mania came to this country from Paris, and about 50 firms rushed into production of funny machines like this one, which came to be called the Bone Shaker, although actually it's rather comfortable. I'm sitting on a bit of sprung steel. It's very heavy, and really, it was more a toy for rich young chaps, not a serious means of transport. Nevertheless, this was how the bicycle came to Britain. Ah, uh, not very good brakes on this, and it's not very elegant getting off either. It was only about 18 months before the bone shaker was superseded by this, the ordinary or high bicycle. By pedalling a huge front wheel of up to five feet high, you could really get up speed, and more athletic gentlemen even began racing them. It was a real macho machine. The disadvantage is you've got to sit directly over that in order to reach your pedals, which means your face is up there somewhere. And that means if you hit a pothole, you go splat on your face. That was called taking a header. The market was wide open for someone with a bright idea to clean up. And in 1887, a Coventry tricycle repairman called John Kemp Starley introduced a design so brilliant that he made himself a fortune and he revolutionised the world of personal transport. This is an original Starley Rover, or safety bicycle. And you'll see it's got two wheels the same size, and most important, it's got a chain so that I'm driving the back wheel, not the front wheel. And because the chain wheel on the pedals is twice as big as the cog at the back, the back wheel is going round twice as fast as my pedals. So you can go very fast on this machine. Starley organised 50 mile and 100 mile time trials. And these bikes smashed all previous records. They saw the high bicycle off the road. And this bicycle design hasn't changed in more than a hundred years. The cyclist didn't have the road to himself. He often got held up by a self-propelled vehicle. 
And this is it, the horseless carriage. Michael, this is a, a steam carriage, yes? That's right, yes. Aren't you a bit bothered having a great boiler with high-pressure steam it's underneath not, It's not as big as all that, and there isn't that much steam down there, and I trust the engineers. <laughs> Victorian technology was ever advancing, and a brand new engine was about to change everything. The steam carriage was coming to the end of the road because it was about to be overtaken by this. This is the petrol-driven car. Fantastic new high technology, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Unfortunately, the development of these things was held up by the Red Flag Act, originally 1865, which said that any horseless carriage had to be preceded by a man walking, waving a red flag to warn the other road users. And the maximum speed limit was two miles an hour in town and four miles an hour in the countryside. Michael, what happened to the red flag? Well, 1896, the act was repealed. It was no longer necessary for you to have a man walking in front of your uh, heavy or light locomotive, and the speed limit went from, from the four miles an hour up to 12 miles an hour in the town. 12. 12 miles an hour in the town and 14 miles an hour in the countryside. Wow. And, and was there any sort of celebration? Yes, there was. The Motor Car Club ran an event, a, a run from London to Brighton, just to prove to the public that motor cars were reliable. There was a man called Harry Lawson, either entrepreneur or charlatan, depending on your view, who'd come out of the bicycle industry and had bought up a whole lot of patents in the car industry, so that quite a lot of the cars taking part in this first run actually came from his manufacturers. How many? 22 out of 33 were his. 22 out of 33? So presumably he won then? No, he didn't. <laughs> no, no, he got it all wrong. Excellent. Because two cars came over from America, the Duria brothers, uh, and one of those got to Brighton first, even though it, was a, it wasn't a race. Um, and Harry Lawson, of course, complained and said they'd cheated <laughs> because they hadn't stopped for a luxurious lunch in Rygate, which is what competitors were supposed to do. Despite losing the race, Harry Lawson claimed victory anyway. He used the London to Brighton rally as a springboard to become one of the biggest early car makers, and he built himself an empire. The Victorian age was a tremendous time of opportunity for entrepreneurs. They did amazing things for us, everything from hydraulics to the motor car. And it was this that drove us into the 20th century. Now, are you ready? Right, to Brighton. And in the unlikely event that you get there first, mine's a pint. OK, let's take her away. Excellent. From seaside ice cream to music halls, the leisure industry, more of what the Victorians did for us here on UK TV History Next. And there's a Victorian seaside flavour over on food too with Danny by the Sea.